My name is Dries Gieshoff and I'm going to talk to you about a wave equation based AVO inversion for high resolution reservoir characterization. <clears throat> okay, this will talk about first answer the question why would we we'd be would we be interested in doing this way this reservoir oriented inversion of seismic data that we talk about linearized versus wave equation based modeling and also linearized versus wave equation based inversion and we wrap up with two case studies. So first we answer the question why would we would we be interested in doing reservoir oriented inversion of seismic data? Well naturally inversion produces property images whereas migration only produces a reflection coefficient image. So if you want to know the reservoir properties, you will have to go to inversion. If you're only interested in the structure, you can just look at your migrated data. The elastic properties we're getting out of this inversion can be indicative of the presence and of reservoir and hydrocarbons. And if you take it further than that, the elastic properties are useful for lithology classification and actually for the prediction of reservoir properties that are of interest for engineers, such as porosity, net to gross, hydrocarbon saturation, etc. <coughs> So we we'll jump straight into the question, linear versus wave equation based models for either modeling or inversion. <clears throat> and simple definition, if your forward modeling is based on primary reflections only and you use propagation in the background medium or just you stay in the time domain, time, time domain altogether, that modeling is called linear modeling. <clears throat> if on the other hand, your forward modeling is based on the full wave equation and it takes place in the true medium. It includes all internal submission effects, internal multiple scattering and mode conversion, etc. Then there is a nonlinear relationship between the data, your properties, and this modeling. It's called nonlinear modeling. And then naturally, if you do inversion, if your inversion is based on the linear data model, it's a linear inversion. If the inversion is based on the nonlinear data model, that will become a nonlinear inversion. Now, to confuse this issue, there is also the constraint that you can add to your inversion, so an otherwise linear data model can be augmented with a nonlinear constraint like sparseness, blockiness, things like that. And that can also be a source of nonlinearity. So the inversion can be nonlinear twice, it can be nonlinear because the data model is nonlinear, it can be nonlinear because the constraint is nonlinear. We jump straight into an example. I have here a set of logs. Normally you're used to seeing density and VP and VS by really decomposers in the, the elastic properties compressibility, which is one over the shear, the block modulus, and the shear compliance, which is one over the shear modulus. You see a very challenging setting with an anhydrite and an embedded carbonate in there. And on the right hand side, the panel we see is just a straightforward linear effectivity model convolved with the band limited wave. Note that the time gate, there's a dotted line connecting the the, uh, the, the end of the depth domain to the end of the time domain. And I've done that because the space below that I need later to, uh, to show you the coda. But this is the linear model. Note that it's a perfectly flat image gather. You see the horizontal axis, it says angle, but actually this is ray parameter. <coughs> Usually I say angle, but I always mean ray parameter because the physics of the problem is always in terms of ray parameter. So this is a perfectly flat image gather. That's what linear modeling gives you. Now we switch to the full wave equation based modeling. And you see a number of things happening. You see, of course, that there is data coming in after the last primary, which is indicative of a coda. That is the multiple scattering that happens inside the domain of interest and keeps ringing after the last primaries come in. And you also see mode conversions. And that is clearly the arrows indicating to a curved event that is a multiple mode conversion. <coughs> So that is non-curvature or non-flatness in the image gather. And to look at the things uh, together, so you see to the left, you see the, the completely wave equation based model, and you see it in the middle, the linear model, and you see the difference. And you see a few things already indicated, the multiple mode conversions, you see indicated by the error, arrow. And you see also <coughs> the, the presence of the coda in general, I already drew your attention to that. <coughs> There are shallow differences, such as time shifts, I already said, the full wave equation based modeling. There's all the propagation in the real depth, in the real domain, whereas the linearized works in the background domain or directly in the time domain. And it can be time shifts, which will show up as a real new event in the difference plot. But there's a significant difference between these two ways of modeling that are more, than, more different than people usually assume. I already said there's a non-flatness and that you have to be careful if you do a radon filter to remove all this non-flatness, you may be actually attacking useful data rather, rather than noise. 
So this is another way of looking at that, and that's something that is really handy if you use the wave equation. This is a kind of a virtual VSP display. You see horizontally the depth domain, and if one of the properties that we use is indicated there, the compatibility in this case. Vertically you have the time domain, and the very first trace in this time domain is the, actually the data trace for zero depth. And then you see the wave field. This is the linear data model, so you have an incident field that's been removed at the dotted line. And you see the, wherever there is a discontinuity in the properties, you see a reflection, and you say an R reflection and transmitted wave of the strength R. And that keeps building up. There are no mode conversions, no multiple reflection, because this is the linear data model. On the right-hand side, you see the PS conversions. If you have PS data, that would be uh, the left-hand side trace of this PS gather. Again, you see the instant wave, the dotted line, and every time you hit a reflector, there's a conversion, and you see an S-wave <coughs> propagating towards the data domain. Now, we contrast this with the full wave equation-based model, where you see a lot more happening. You see really now, all of a sudden, multiple reflections. You see things parallel to the first direct arrival. And you see all these dots, which indicate that some conversion, either by reflection or transmission or conversion. And you see in the PS domain also multiple mode conversions. And you could actually track these events. You could draw lines along the incident field, P reflection, S transmission, etc. And you can really sort of see what there is in your, in your data. <clears throat> and if you toggle between these two displays, you look at the PP data, the left-hand side trace is for the linear modeling. And this is the full wave equation-based modeling. You see a big difference. And if you do your normal linear inversion, you ignore this difference. <clears throat> now, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating, so we look at inversion based on these two models. We've got the same data set, which is the full wave equation-based data set as being representative for, the, for reality. And now we have a, a simple inversion based on the linear data model, and that's even a damped inversion, no sparseness or anything. You see the, the result in the, in the wiggly line, you see the model in the background, <clears throat> And you see the, 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 the bullet points say that you know, the data is not fully explained, so the, the coda is not explained at all. There's still curvature in there that's not explained. And the result is clearly band limited. You see that the inverse result is wiggly and not, it doesn't have the angularity of the, the, real, the, the, real, the real model. Now we can go a step further and we say we bring in a nonlinear constraint. So we go from still a linear data model and we go to sparse spike inversion. So now you see that uh, the, the sharpness of the image has improved. Still, the data has not been fully explained, but you see clearly an increase in bandwidth due to the extra constraint. But the, the target, this carbonate layer embedded in the anhydride, is still quantitatively not fully resolved. Finally, we go for the wave equation-based inversion, where you really solve the full wave equation. And now you see that you get a very good match of the, the quantitative match. The carbonate is fully uh, recovered. The data is fully explained. And the result is really broadband, and that's because this FWRS, full waveform inversion, reservoir oriented, that's what it stands for, is really broadband because of the nonlinear relationship between the data and the properties. <coughs> now we have two case studies to, to wrap this up. I have two case studies for you, rather extreme cases. The first is from the, the North Sea, four kilometers deep in the Carboniferous, with only a maximum offset of 3,000 meters. PSDM data, pre stack PSDM data as input, and only a single well to calibrate and give, provide a background for a whole area of 180 square kilometers. This is the, the data, so the PSDM data, it is the stack, not of course the input to the inversion. And you see the base very weakly on, below the bright event, you see the, the base permanent conformity, and against that you see some amplitudes, and that's highlighted by the arrows here. You see some maybe amplitude anomalies, it's not very clear whether they are amplitude anomalies or not, because they don't stand out, and this is clearly a reflectivity-based, acoustic impedance-based display. Now we invert this, so we went to the wave equation-based inversion and we inverted the data, and I displayed it next. And now you see that all of a sudden, there's these red blobs, they are they're really sort of high compressibility, means they're really porous and or hypercarbon-filled reservoir. If you toggle, you see in the, in the amplitude display of the migration, it doesn't really stand out if you go to the wave equation-based inversion, these things really stand out. Now you, you try to, ex to explain that, and here's a display that gives you the acoustic impedance as a function. That's the red curve. To the left, zero means it's all gas and no water. To the right, one means all water and no gas. And you have the relative acoustic impedance. You see the equation there as a function of water saturation. And on top of the blue line, the curve is the compressibility parameter that we use in the full wave equation-based inversion. 
also in dimension is against the background of water. And you see that the compressibility is three times more sensitive to hydrocarbons than the usual acoustic impedance. That explains why we saw the, the in the compressibility display, we saw these, uh, compass, these high porous hydrocarbon filled areas stand out so well. <coughs> and I already pointed out, <coughs> it's the hydrocompressibility is much more sensitive to changes in pore fill than acoustic impedance. Now, here you see the same display. <coughs> you see, indeed, uh, the, the arrows indicating the high compressibility, probably gas-filled reservoir. You see the gas-water contact. It's roughly in agreement with the gas-water. With the left, it certainly is. With the right, I draw your attention to the fact I only had one well to calibrate the, uh, of the provide the background, which means that away from that well, your, your, your depths, it's all in depth, may not be perfect. But then we have, of course, the, the, the wells, blind tests were drilled after the inversion. You see the two well tracks, and now we, I give you the logs, these are the gamma ray. And if you look at first concentrated on the one on the left, you see exactly where this bright spot is. You see a low gamma ray, which was confirmed to be a gas-filled sand. Spot on, where that right blob is right on the seismic, it didn't stand out at all. To the right, it's depth-wise not perfect, but very strong indication if you look at the gamma ray, low gamma ray, wherever this well track almost clips the bright amplitude, you see a low gamma ray, which is indicative of sand, which was confirmed gas barren. <coughs> I have another extreme other case study for you, which is the Sleipner CO2 storage project, where we attempted quantitative estimation of the amount of CO2 injected, which is of course important, because if you know what you, what you, what you inject, but you don't find it back in the inversion, it means something has leaked. And we applied this as many vintage, we applied this inversion to the 2008 vintage, and we tried to estimate the quantitative amount of CO2 in place. Well, this, you, you use a similar curve as I showed before, except that I reverse the scale, now you go from 0% CO2 to 100% CO2, and you have the compressibility as a function of CO2 saturation. You have to assume a density with the CO2, it's a bit difficult because it's close to the triple point, but it's an average value in the row of 300, 600 kilogram per cubic meter. And you see on the top of the box, you see the porosity, the depth of the target, etc. So this is the way to translate compressibility predictions from inversion to actually amounts of CO2 injected. <coughs> this is uh, the three pictures you see on the left, you see roughly the background of the the, the used from seismic, the seismic amplitude gives you a rough contour of where the CO2 plume is. And in the CO2 plume, we use another background because we knew the gas injection will give a much softer, softer uh, compress compressibility and, uh, and hydrocarbon and uh, <coughs> shear modulus. In the middle, we see the inversion result with some of the red spots really standing out. And then you have to apply a cutoff and you extract the geobody, which is the green on the right, which is now the CO2 all above a certain cutoff, and that all you have to do is now sum the pixels of that of that geobody and apply your conversion curve that takes you from compressibility to amount of CO2 injected, and you have the total volume of CO2. Now, if you see that here, we have the uh, the we use the invert compressibilities inside the plume, inside the cutoff, which is the geobody. And we use the saturation from the curve, and we now calculate that the total amount of CO2 injected is 12 megatons. This, of course, can be compared directly with what we know, because at the date of the 2008 survey, we knew there was 11, 000, 11 megatons injected. So we think that's quantitatively, that's a very, very good agreement. Now, we could play this game for CO2. You can, of course, play it also for hydrocarbons in, in a reservoir. So this workflow that I described is really ideally suited to get the hydrocarbon reserve in, in, in a reservoir when you know the gas field or oil field, and that should lead, of course, to good field development plans and investment decisions. <coughs> I finished with a few remarks on resolution of this method. It's a nonlinear relationship between the data and the properties. I already mentioned that. This, this full waveform inversion reservoir oriented can give a wider spatial bandwidth than what you would expect on the basis of the seismic data. Sometimes very difficult for geophysicists to grasp that, but this nonlinear relationship is really essential to explain this wider bandwidth. <coughs> we can actually fill the gap between the background that we use and the bandwidth of the data. So the, the FWRS full waveform based technique will, will fill that gap, the bandwidth, the bandwidth gap, and on really good data and on synthetic data, it will even update your DC. It will actually update the background. So you're not dependent on the background at all anymore. There are no constraints in the sense that you have lateral or vertical constraints except this blockiness enhancing 
what we call a minimum total variation, which is multiplicative. I don't go into the details here, but that is a kind of a blockiness. And that should, on the high side, also give you a little bit of improvement in your bandwidth. <clears throat> All the locations are, are inverted completely independently, so there's no force that drives them to be similar to each other. And yet, you seem to be forgetting a very coherent solution. Finally, the acknowledgement. I showed you two data sets. The Wingate data was given to us by Wintershall, and the Sleipner data was made available by Statoil and TNO. Thank you.